Hey everyone, welcome back to Big Strong Book. I'm Reed, and today we are going to be discussing chapters 8 and 9 of the Dragon Bone Chair. So we're going to begin with discussing chapter 8, Bitter Air and Sweet. So this chapter um, kind of continues on the same lines of the last chapter where we get a little bit further in time. This isn't so much back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back events. Uh, and we open with um, Simon and Jeremias, the Chandler's boy who's kind of helping him. He's a, Jeremias is another castle boy, and uh, whenever Jeremias is referred to, Simon always thinks of him as like fat Jeremias. It's always a little, little bit of a funny thing, so I'll just read the opening of chapter 8 here. It was late in the month of Jonever. The rains had still not come. As the sun began to sink behind the western walls and insects gossiped in the tall grass, Simon and Jeremias, the Chandler's boy, sat back to back and panting. Come on then, Simon forced himself to his feet. Let's have another go. Jeremias, now unsupported, slumped backward until he lay outstretched in the scratchy grass like an upended tortoise. You go on, he wheezed. I'll never be a soldier. Of course you will, said Simon, annoyed at such talk. We both will. You were much better last time. Come on, get up. With a groan of pain, Jeremias allowed himself to be tugged upright. He reluctantly took the barrel stave Simon handed to him. Let's go in, Simon. I heard all over. You think too much, Simon responded and lifted his own stave. Have at you, Simon smacked on stave, or stave smacked on stave. Ouch, Simon yelped. Ho ho, chortled Jeremias, much heartened. A mortal blow. The clicking and smacking resumed. So Simon now, you know, as he's been getting along helping um, Dr. Morganis, he has grown a little bit, not unsettled. Unsettled isn't the right word. He's grown more just restless. You know, he is kind of caught up in the zeal that has taken on Elias's first year as king, even though we start to hear word of these just dire things that are going on throughout the high ward. Um, Simon is, he's beginning to understand a little bit about what he wants or what he thinks he wants out of life. And what he wants right now, what him and Jeremiah actually both want is to be a soldier. They want to be soldiers. Um, and Jeremiah is kind of, uh, you know, he's, He's more pessimistic about their chances um, of becoming a king. Uh, and they kind of go out, I believe, into to Urchester, and they're, they're looked down upon as castle people, and that is strange for, um, for Simon. And then next we have an interesting um, dream that Simon has. I, I think this might be... One of the, I can't really recall a big dream sequence before this point, but in this dream sequence, Simon is moving through kind of halls within the Hayholt and he approaches the throne room. And I'll kind of read a little bit of this dream. It's about a three page sequence, but um, the yellowing throne, the dragon bone chair, stood in the room's center. Around it danced a linked circle of figures, hands clasped, moving as slowly as if they were in deep, deep water. He recognized several, Judith, Rachel, Jacob the Chandler, and other castle folk, their faces stretched with wild merriment as they bowed and capered. Among them moved dancers more grand, King Elias, Guthwolf of Utenyet, Gwyn Gwynthin of Hernestir, these like the castle folk wheeled as slowly and deliberately as ageless ice-grinding mountains down to dust. Scattered about the silent circle were looming figures, shiny black as beetles. The Malachite kings come down from their pedestals to join the sluggish festivity. And in the middle bulked the great chair, a skull-peaked mountain of dull ivory that seemed somehow full of vitality, suffused with an ancient energy that held the circling dancers by taut, invisible reins. So they eventually start to beckon towards him, and, and Ra the, the figure of Rachel within this dream kind of beckons him, um, and 
Rachel says, come boy, come, can you not feel the place we have left for you? A place especially prepared. Um, and, you know, then he, as he's being pulled and as they're all, as all the figures are kind of grinning eerily at him, then he wakes up and somebody's been shouting at him and he realizes it's Duke is Grimner. Duke is Grimner is kind of in this room where a lot of the the cat the servants the or the male servants of the castle sleep, and he is looking for uh, Towser. And as he's kind of taking in Simon again, Duke is Grimner. This is the first time that the, that they're meeting, um, and so so we get a chance to hear Duke is Grimner's or like to to listen in on his inner thoughts to what he thinks of Simon, and he mentions, he just says here, uh, with that nose and thatch of, what is it, red hair? The boy looks like a bedamned marsh bird, is Grimner thought. So he's looking for Towser, uh, the jester, and so, you know, Simon kind of points in the direction of where he is, uh, and Towser, and is Grimner is, a little bit frantic, and he t and he tells Towser, Prince Joshua is gone. We can't find him. We don't know where he is, and Towser's confused because it's like, ah, oh, he was going to go out to to Naglamund soon, and I was going to come with him. I told him I'd you know be his court jester up there in Naglamund, um. And this is what his Grimner tells him. He says, "No, man, he is gone. Left sometime after middle night, as far as I can tell." Or so said the Urken guardsman I found at his empty chamber when I went to keep meeting time with him. He had asked me to come so late, though I would have rather been abed, but he said it was something that would not wait. Does that sound like a, a man who would leave without even a message for me? So, you know, Joshua, there, there, was, there was something that was clearly bothering Joshua, and he wanted to meet with his Grimner. He tr and it, it, it was set up, actually, in yesterday's chapter in chapter seven it was set up of the implicit trust between Joshua and Isgrimner that same trust that is a little bit at a distance between Isgrimner and King Elias so we, obviously it is something important and Isgrimner knows this we know this as the reader and Isgrimner as the character knows this as well um and then so you know, Towser and his Grimner are both kind of left there scratching their heads. They don't know where he is. They don't know why he would have gone potentially without leaving a message. So the question of where is Joshua, that's kind of a big question mark in the sky for all of these characters. Um, then we jump to a little scene with uh, Jeremiah, Isaac, uh, Simon with Morganis, and they're sent to go out into the King's Wood to get these mushrooms for Morganis. And we get, as these boys are out in the Kinswood, we get a little bit more detail for us as the readers of what is going on in the greater world at, because they're discussing it amongst themselves. And so Isaac mentions um, a, a plague that is going on in Merrimond where... Um, you know, there's this big thing that's going on, and um, Simon mentions that Elias has made Guthwolf uh, the king's hand, and then uh, they wrote out um, to uh, that ma many people in Hernestir have also um, died of what seems to be the plague, um, and. Yeah, that, so Guthwolf has taken um, harsh measures in Merriman. That's what Isaac tells, or that's what, excuse me, that's what Jeremiah tells um, Isaac and Simon because he heard of it from Jacob, the, the Chandler, his master. And so the harsh measures that they talk about are, so they, they went into Merriman. And again, remember, Merriman, I mean, this is key mainly for first-time readers, just to, 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 re to remember at least in relation of, you know, where characters are from, what towns are kind of under their domain. So before Elias became king, he was kind of the lord, 
I don't even know, uh, the prince, he, he, Merrimond was his domain. Likewise, how Naglamond will become Joshua's domain. So Merrimond uh, was where uh, Elias, his daughter Miriamel, that's where they came from before they came to reside in the Hayholtz when Elias became king and, and uh, his father John died. Um, and so they talk about uh, uh, the Urken guard went into Merrimond and they, you know, took boards and they sealed in uh, these people who had the plague, um, and then they burned the houses. They sealed them in the houses, and then they burned the houses to the ground. And it just says, Simon Mar you know, as Simon marveled at this last detail, there was the sound of breaking branches. He only has a little bit to really process this thought, to process what is going on, and then, um, you know, Morganis comes in, and then we get a little a little bit of an interaction between Jeremiah and Simon because Jeremiah is saying like, "Oh, are you going to talk to talk to um, Morganis about this?" And uh, and Simon mentions he says Jeremiah is interested in joining the guards, and um, Count uh, Bregar is overseeing uh, the Urken guard um and we were wondering if like you would write a letter of recommendation but Simon says he says to Morganis he says I'll write it and then you can you can sign it and as like oh oh Dr. Morganis this will be a great test of my penmanship I, I will write the letter and you will approve it and clearly we don't have it confirmed yet. We will, and obviously in, in chapter nine, but um, Simon wants to be a part of the guard too. He's just, he's using Jeremiah to be like, oh, Jeremiah wants to, but he wants to as well. And obviously we'll see in the next chapter. But then as they're kind of going about wrapping up everything um, from their kind of looking for mushrooms in the Kinswood, they find a dead body. Um, and Simon asks, how did he die? And he uh, he got shot with an arrow. Um, so then, but then that chapter ends. So there's been a dead body discovered in, um, in the Kinswood and from kind of, the beard and from the markings that he had on his body, it, it appears as if he's a Northman, that he's a Rimmersman. But then chapter eight ends. And then of course, as we're discussing, in addition to chapter eight, we are discussing chapter nine, Smoke on the Wind. So we jump right into um, Jeremiah and Simon going to uh, the, um, the main church in Urchester. So they're passing, it says like main row, tavern way. So we're getting a little bit of detail. Obviously there's, they're just walking through the streets of Urchester. They're kind of taking everything in. And then they go to um, the church, Saint, the, and the, the church is called Saint Sutron. Um, and Simon goes in and he's like, hey guys, I have a message for Count uh, Bruyagar from Morganis himself. And then they kind of wiggle their way into being able to, uh, you know, to uh, try to discuss it with, with the Count himself. Um, and uh, Count Bruegar kind of he take, takes the letter and he says, and the letter as he reads it says, please consider the bearers for service under your lordship's guidance. But Simon freaks out because he wrote the letter, Morganis signed off on it, but then Simon went back in and added a little S by bearer to make, to hope that Bruyagar would think that it meant both Simon and Jeremiah, so both of them would be considered uh, for the guard. But Bruyagar, uh, um, Breugar, he he shoots both of them down and he says, you know, you know, I, he says, uh, so uh, Breugar fluted the sound like a sorrowful breath. Morganis, the old apothecary, wants me to take on a couple of castle mice and turn them into men. 
He picked up a tiny haunch from his plate and chewed on the bone. Impossible. Simon felt his knees buckle and his stomach push up towards his throat. But, but why? He stammered. Because I don't need you. I have fighting men enough. I can't afford you. No one can plant if it doesn't rain, and I have men lined up already looking for a job of work that will feed them. But most important, I don't want you. A couple of suet-soft castle boys who have felt nothing more painful in their lives than a smack on their pink arses for stealing cherries. Go on with you. If war comes, if those sneering heathen in Hernestir continue to resist the king's will or, tre or treacherous Joshua turns up, then you can carry a pitchfork or scythe with the rest of the peasants. Maybe you can even follow the army and water the horses if manpower gets short enough. But you'll never be soldiers. The king didn't make me lord constable to nursemaid groundlings. Sergeant, show these castle mice a new hole to scamper out. Obviously, Simon and Jeremiah are deeply affected. Simon almost wants to cry because, again, he, he views this as his path out. He's viewing more about the world. He knows that there's an out for him. And obviously, as to many in, in stories like this, um, and for many in the real world, potentially, kind of joining the armed forces might be that, that way out, th that way to, to see the world. Simon certainly views it as such. But then, then we leave Simon for a bit and we go back to Dukas Grimner, who's in like a stuffy closet in the Hall of Records. And he's talking about meeting a, you know, a, a damned uh, Hernestierman. And the Hernestierman is uh, a character who is, who was in the, mentioned briefly in Chapter 7. Um, he was kind of presented as a background character, but it is... Count uh, Ailair of Nad Malak, the Count of uh, uh, Nad Malak. And so he arrives in and is Grimner's kind of pissed at Ailair because he came alone when he also wanted Escritor Velagus. And Escritor Velagus, of course, as we know from, I think, chapter five or six, is maybe chapter six. Um, Escritor Velagus came with... Um, Lector Ranison, uh, Father Dinovan, uh, along with kind of the other uh, Nabonai and Adonite people when Prester John died. So obviously there is something that they, that they want to discuss. Um, and is Grimner uh, just begins talking, and I'll kind of read here, because um, I kind of say, well, who wants to talk first? Who, who wants to really get into the, the heat of the matter first? And so this is what his Grimner says. It's this way, he said, I would be the last to hold Elias to blame for this bedamned weather. I should know, while it's hot as the devil's breath and dry as a bone here, in my land in the north we're having a terrible winter, snows and ice that beat anything remembered. So weather here is no fault of the king's, any more than the roofs collapsed and the castle frozen in the barn halls in Rimmersgard are mine. Of course, Elias is to blame for keeping me here while my kinsfolk and people suffer, but that is another line and another hook. No, it's that the man doesn't seem to care. The wells drying up, the farms lying fallow, starving people sleeping in the fields, and cities a choke with the plague, and he seems not to notice." The tax and levies go up, and be damned arse-licking pups of the nobility he has befriended ring him round all day, drinking and singing and fighting and end, the old duke grunted in disgust, and the tournaments. So, you know, Elias, as we see through the gaze of Isgrimner and, um, and Aelair, is, is kind of along the same lines of thinking as um, as with his Grimner, Aelair and his Grimner are both in agreement that, you know, Elias is not an attentive king. And we are seeing this because, and Simon is realizing it in his own way of just the stories of, um, of all the, all the tournaments, all this revelry. But of course, when you are so consumed with, you know, there's working hard and there's playing hard, 
And right now, Elias is playing hard. But is it just because he, you know, just wants to be king in the same way that uh, Simba and the Lion King did, where he thinks it's all just going to be a good, a good old time? Um, but is Grimner is, you know, he is worried about those around him because Elias, while being inherently jealous and with a short fuse, as we saw before he became king, he also surrounds himself with some kind of ill-favored cronies, Fengbald, uh, Breugar, Guthwolf. But Isgrimner is also concerned about Pryrates as well, kind of that, the, 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 the mad priest that is with him as well. Because um, he says, he says to, a he tells Aelair, you know it is that vicious bastard Pryrates who fills his head with strange notions and keeps him up nights in that tower with lights and unholy noises until sometimes it seems that the king does not know where he is when the sun is up. What could Elias want from such a creature as that whore son priest? He is king of the known world. What could Pryrates possibly have to offer him? Again, we still don't know. We know Pryrates, we don't know why he is there, why he is kind of the worm tongue to Elias's Theoden. We don't know what he wants. Um, and again, he is, um, there's, a you know, is Grimner is beginning to think that, um, other world leaders are also not sitting well with this, that Duke Leobardus and Lector Ranison, as he mentions, they kind of rule Nabon, as he says, a two-headed monarch. You have the church, and then you have the duke. Um, and Guthwolf stole a couple uh, Na uh, Nabonai ships that were docked in Hernestir as under the guise of, oh, these ships have the plague on them, we have to get them out of here. Um, and Aelair's curious, and, and, he, and Aelair tells his Grimner, of what Duke Leobardus thinks of this act of piracy, three grain ships thieved outright in a Hernestir harbor, Velgus professes not to know. On his master's behalf, he is, as ever, vague. His sacredness, Ranison, I think, has designs to be a peacemaker between Elias and Duke Leobardus, and perhaps at the same time improve the position of your Adenite church here at court. My master, King Luth, the king of Hernestir, has directed me next to travel to Nabon, and I perhaps and perhaps I will find out the truth of the that when I am there. I fear, however, that if such is the case, the lector has misjudged. If the snubbing that Elias and his sick offense has have given Velagus is any indication, the king is more restless even than his father was under Mother Church's broad shadow. Scrimner kind of complains about all the churches that are going or the the plots that are going on, and then he mentions the man that was found dead in the Kinswood, is Grimner says it is one of his own men. Um, because obviously, as we know, Scully, um, he, sharp-nosed Scully, went north uh, on Elias's orders, and he sent this man, um, I forget, uh, this, na this man, his name is, the man who died, uh, his name is uh, Bind Bindisek, and he sent him out there with a message to Isgrimner's son, Isorn, uh, that Isgrimner wants his son, Isorn, to keep a close eye on Skali. And uh, Isgrimner thinks that Skali killed uh, Bindisek. And he's confused as to why he would do it or, or who really did it. Um, and Aelair just closes off their meeting with saying, these are strange times indeed, my friend, he said, and took a deep breath. And perhaps the most important question of all, where in this strange world is Prince Joshua? And then we have a little bit of um, Simon up on the roof, similar to a few chapters before where he's kind of viewing the world. And there's this, um, there's this cat kind of scuttling around and he remembers he was up here on the roof before to witness the mustering of the Irking Guard as they went out to a town called Falshire because 
Falshire has a lot of shepherds, and they were going to use their sheep to aid. There, there has been a lot of like refugees, crowds kind of piling into Urchester, the town outside of the Hayholds, and so they're going to send the Urchin Guard to take their sheep, which they also, with the people in Falshire need, but to use them to kind of feed the crowds in Urchester. And so there's this, uh, there's this cat, um, but then it, he says something interesting. So Simon thinks something interesting. He thinks, Rachel and the others are right. Here I am daydreaming again. Fengbald and his noble friends will never know if I live or die. I must make something of myself. I don't want to be a child forever, do I? Besides, I would probably look foolish in armor, wouldn't I? So it's kind of the the devil and the angel on his shoulders kind of saying, yes, you want to make something of yourself, but you're going to look like a fool. He's wrestling with this. He knows he wants to get out. He knows he wants to make something of himself, but he doesn't know what. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. He just knows he has to make it happen somehow. And then um, he looks in the distance and he sees Falshire burning. And that's where it ends with chapter 9. So in interesting uh, couple of chapters, we get hints of the inner machinations. Again, the, there are, we hear about things that are going on in the outside world. We get insight into characters like his Grimner, and we get a, a more of a proper introduction to Count Aelair. Um, and again, it's like, where's Carmen Sandiego? Where is Prince Joshua, the man of the hour, the man that everybody wants to figure out where he is? We don't know where he is. Um, so those are the questions that are plaguing us at the end of chapter nine. Uh, so for all you uh, first time readers, I, I bid you farewell as I'm gonna dive into some uh, spoiler things here. Uh, and then tomorrow we'll be discussing chapters 10 and 11. So uh, for, again, spoilers from here on out. So for spoilers, um, obviously, we are getting closer and closer um, to Simon making something of himself or Simon taking the first step in his journey. Uh, and obviously, he doesn't know that this change will come at the tragedy of Morganus dying. Um, but he's getting closer and it's building and it's building and it's building, building again, as Tad Williams does, at a very deliberate pace. And let me just go back, because the first thing I want to talk about is the dream that he has at the beginning of chapter 8. So he, there are all these figures kind of dancing around the dragon bone chair. And it's almost as if it hints that he will become king. Because when Rachel tells him, I, can you not feel the place we have left for you, a place especially prepared? But, you know, and it's not like everybody within this uh, will die, I believe, if I'm correct in thinking, because I don't even think Rachel dies in the original trilogy. Um, but he's freaked out by that. It's almost as if it forebodes to his destiny of becoming king, but that the destiny will be, it'll be a very tough and strange path to get there, kind of given the um, avant-garde qualities of the dream he has. So that's what I got from that, that that's what it hints at from what Rachel tells um, Simon. And then with Joshua missing, obviously, as we all know, kind of he's hidden in one of the, the dungeons of the Hayholt, and I think that's resolved within the next couple of chapters when Simon finds Joshua. Um, and then, of course, Guthwolf burning down houses. I mean, Gu you know, Guthwolf was a character that you, you, you learned to, to really hate, but then, man, Guthwolf is just so fascinating into Green Angel Tower when he is blinded and he's kind of just wandering the castle and he's freaking out and he's addicted to the sword and all of that. He, he is a character that, like some others, I will be intensely paying attention to Guthwolf 
because of how interesting his character arc becomes in an unexpected way, because I just kind of wrote off Guth Wolf as being to be just more of like the henchman or the crony, but he has a very almost disturbed arc. Um, so that's kind of it for chapter eight in terms of spoiler stuff. Um, Count Breugar, I forget what ultimately ends up happening with him. I kind of, I don't remember uh, where he ends up at the end of the day. Um, and then obviously the stuff with Duke Leobardus, it'll be interesting to see that plot line again, um, kind of with his son, I, if I remember correctly, betraying him at the end of this book. I might be thinking of somebody else. Um, or I might be thinking of um, King Luth, the Hernest Steerman, because we haven't even seen Megwin yet. Um, that's an, let me flip through the back of the book here. Um, right, yeah, because um, Gwythin. Yeah, I, I, but I, I believe, if I remember correctly, that it's Benegaris that kills Leobardus. Um, but I think Gwith, no, Gwythin dies. Um, Gwythin and Luth die, and that's when Megwin, yeah, that's right. I'm just remembering that now. That's, because that's how Megwin becomes kind of the leader of the Hernesteri people. Interesting that we haven't really heard Megwin mentioned at all, considering the significant character that she becomes. And she's another character that I will follow closely as well, because she has such a torture she has such a like so many characters that I'm mentioning as characters that I will pay more attention to in this read through all of them have tortured arcs I mean Kadrak, Guthwolf, Megwin we're talking about characters that have a wild up and down roller coaster ride um and then let me just kind of look through more of this here again I think that's it for spoilers for this as well obviously is Sorn Scully, the stuff. I mean, is Grimner and Aelair two of my favorite characters? I love those guys. So it'll just be fun to kind of relive their stuff again. And especially as is Grimner and Simon will reunite when they're, you know, when they're on the road later. So that'll be really fun. Um, so yeah, let me know uh, down below what you think of uh, these two chapters. And I will see you guys uh, tomorrow for a discussion of chapters 10 and 11.